had to be in Switzerland to meet with his uh, with his new clients. We're very happy though that Dr. Ronald Hicks could fill in with this lecture on uh, hinges and stone circles. He uh, he made this lecture about a month ago on the uh, university faculty lecture series and it was one that I knew that we would want to schedule in our college as soon as possible and so I was very happy we had this opportunity. Dr. Hicks has a very interesting uh, bio data. It's about 10 pages that I won't give you all of, but I want to give you uh, some parts of it because it is, uh, it's most interesting. He received a bachelor's degree from Purdue University in 1963, and his major was international relations, and his minor was mathematics. In 1975, he received a, a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and, and his dissertation uh, dealt with the same topic he'll be speaking of tonight. His teaching experience has included Ursinus College, the Wagner Free Institute of Science, Spring Garden College, Hahnemann Medical Medical College, where he was an instructor in the Institute for Human Resources Development, the Community College of Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, and now he's been at uh, Ball State University since 1976. The courses he's taught along the way have included introductory cultural anthropology, physical anthropology, archaeology, folklore, cultural resources management, seminars in archaeological theory and scientific techniques in archaeology, practice in archaeological research, field methods in archaeology, laboratory methods, uh, European prehistory and Near Eastern prehistory. His field work has, has included Indiana, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Scotland, and Ireland. He is a contributing editor of Archaeoastronomy, the Bulletin of the Center for Archaeoastronomy in, uh, at the University of Maryland. He is co-editor of the Old World Archaeology Newsletter. His um, publications include, uh, have been, he's been published in the Bulletin of the Philadelphia Anthropo Anthropological Society, the magazine Expedition, the Journal of the Royal Society of Ar Antiquarians of Ireland, the Irish Archaeological Research Forum, Forum the American Archaeologist, uh, Mondo Archaeologico in Florence, and many other publications. His honors include being honored as outstanding faculty member by the uh, Ball State Mortar Board Senior Honorary in 1980. His other employment and experience beyond Ball State and those other teaching assignments has included, starting in 1956 to 62, he's been a draftsman, a barn painter, a library shelver, and a taxi driver. He has uh, served in the Navy starting in 1963 and later in the reserves as a division officer and assistant department head, an education officer on the USS Seminole, a Naval Reserve Instructor, and his final Naval Reserve rank in 1972 was Lieutenant Commander. He has been an Assistant Production Editor for Prentice Hall. He's been an Assistant Editing Supervisor for the World Publishing Company, Managing Editor of American Anthropologist, Assistant Medical Editor uh, for the W.B. Saunders Company in Philadelphia, Staff Director of the University Development Commission at the University of Pennsylvania. It's very uh, interesting, I think, to have a man with this breadth of experience uh, speaking and being with us tonight. Ron Hicks. Thank you. I think what that list probably indicates mostly is that I have a short attention span. Be speaking on hinges and stone circles. 
which may not exactly be architecture, but at least they're structures in some sense. Uh, I know your speaker, the topic listed for the speaker who was supposed to be here was water, and I think we can just consider this one earth and stone, which isn't too far off. Um, most of it's going to be based on slides, so we might as well dim the lights and see if I can get a picture on here. There we go. That should be familiar to everyone. Stonehenge. That particular photo is courtesy of National Geographic. I uh, was doing some consulting work for them a couple of years ago, and they kindly gave me a lot of nice slides. <coughs> Stonehenge is unquestionably the best-known prehistoric monument of the British Isles. What isn't so well-known, at least in this country, is that it's not the only stone circle. Although many have been destroyed through the ages, there once were at least 960 of them. Further, Stonehenge is a compound monument. What you see here is a Bronze Age circle of stones. That's the most prominent feature, um, and it is, in fact, the third and final stage of the monument. The process of construction and reconstruction actually began several hundred years earlier, around 2700 BC, in the late Neolithic, with what you see here as the outer ring. Um, if you look at Stonehenge from the air, as we're doing here, or even on the ground, if you are uh, noticing anything besides the stones, what we see is a circular earthen bank. It's about 300 feet in diameter with an entrance on the northeast. Monuments of this sort uh, are called henges after Stonehenge. Uh, it's not a terribly good name because stone, the henge refers really to the hanging stones, the lintels in uh, the monument there. But once people began to figure out about 50 years ago that there were others similar to this, um, they just, by analogy, I guess you could say, called them henges. So we have this bank and ditch going around Stonehenge. There are approximately 170 of these known. Some, like the example at Stonehenge, enclose stone circles. This is Brogler in the Orkney Islands off the coast of Scotland. Many of them do not. You just have the bank and ditch by itself, as you can see in the distance. They vary tremendously in size as well. Stonehenge is the most architecturally sophisticated of the stone circles, with the carefully shaped standing stones linked by the stone lintels. The lintels at Stonehenge, by the way, have been carefully carved to give, uh, so they're slightly wider at the top to allow for perspective. The Stonehenge isn't the largest stone circle, nor is the surrounding earthwork the largest henge enclosure. Both are about average in size. The circles and henges, in fact, vary widely. At one extreme, we have the damaged but still awe-inspiring earthwork at Avebury. This is about 17 miles north of Stonehenge. Here the earthwork is nearly a mile in circumference, large enough that a medieval village grew up in its center, with a massive bank enclosing a quarry ditch that originally uh, was 30 feet deep. The black dot off on the side there is a cow to give you some idea of the size of this thing. Remember, this was dug entirely with antler picks, wooden spades, baskets to haul the dirt. Along the inner lip of this ditch once stood a circle of 100 of these huge stones. This is a fairly complete section that you see in the photo, but most of the uh, most parts of that have been destroyed. Inside that circle were two more, rather like the eyes in some large effigy of a long forgotten mm -hmm. deity, which in fact it may be, we don't know for sure. Um, John Aubrey, writing late in the 17th century, said that comparing Stonehenge to Avebury was like comparing a parish church to a cathedral. Yet, for some reason, Stonehenge has enjoyed world renown, and until recently, no one's paid too much attention to Avebury. Elsewhere in Britain and Ireland, we find henges and circles that are so much less impressive that they can easily be missed entirely. For example, we have the earthen henges of Clash and Dark up in Scotland, all nicely covered with purple heather. And Kura site F, F prime, I should say, there are about 23 earthworks within a radius of a couple of miles on uh, the area of open range near Kildare, so they've just been given letters. So this little tiny thing is really a henge monument, but a very small one. It's never been excavated, so we don't know what it has in it. <coughs> we have tiny stone circles as well. This is Cashel Keelty down in County Cork in the southwest of Ireland. 
Uh, the big stone on the side is part of an alignment. The stone circle is this little group right in front of us, two of which have pretty well been destroyed, but three are standing still. Um, the smallest of the circles are really more square than circular because they have only four small stones in them and are usually just called four posters. Now, between these extremes fall a wide range of monuments that you would hardly think belong together at all, except that they resemble one another more than anything else. For example, there are embanked stone circles, like Ranaf Kromdu. Nobody's too sure what that means, except it's got something to do with Black Krom, who's supposed to have brought agriculture to Ireland. This lies about 12 miles south of Limerick, between Limerick on the road between Limerick and Killarney. Uh, there are also circles where the stones stand almost shoulder to shoulder, as in the Rollerite stones. This is on the road, or near the road, from Oxford to Stratford-on-Avon in England. Among the most intriguing of these variations on the theme are the recumbent stone circles, found only in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. Uh, the recumbents have that name because one stone is lying flat on its side, and where these have been checked out, they're almost perfectly horizontal. We'll get to the why of that a bit later. But they do occur in Aberdeenshire in Scotland and in County Cork in Ireland, which is about as far away from Aberdeenshire as you can get and still be in the British Isles. Here's yet another one from County Cork. The variations that you've seen are, are where the first problem I was forced to confront when I first began to do my research on Irish henges in 1973. What exactly was a henge monument? How could they be distinguished from the literally thousands of other circular earthworks surviving in Ireland, most of which are Iron Age farmsteads like this one? When I mentioned the subject of my research, the henges, to Rory de Valera, who was uh, at that time head of the Department of Archaeology at University College of Dublin, also son of the president and one of the founders of the country, his response was, henge monuments? Do you believe in henge monuments? I don't believe in henge monuments, and that was the end of the conversation. So <clears throat> after six months in the field, I wasn't too sure I did either. But eventually things began to fall in place. The henges in Great Britain had been studied since about 1930, um, but no one had paid any attention to those in Ireland, or at least not much. Occasionally you'd run across an offhand reference or a comment such that uh, such and such an earthwork appears to have affinities to the British henges. The classic definition of a henge, classic in this case goes all the way back to 1951, is that a henge is a circular earthen bank, usually with a quarry ditch inside rather than outside, as one would expect in a fortification, and with one, two, or rarely more entrances marked by breaks in the bank and unexcavated causeways across the ditch, all very complicated. If you want to get a good idea, just wander over to Mound State Park and look at the Great Mound, which is a classic example of a henge. It has no connection with the ones in Britain and Ireland, but it's uh, a case of people in similar environments at a similar level of development coming up with very similar ideas. So you have a bank ditch inside and a causeway entranceway. Well, a lot of the uh, Irish henges failed to meet all the criteria that I just listed most often because they lacked any sort of clear-cut internal ditch. That didn't automatically exclude them from being called henges because some of the British ones don't either. And Stonehenge, which is more or less the type site for the, this kind of monument, has an external ditch rather than an internal one. There are several henges in Yorkshire, that's one of them, that have ditches both inside and outside the bank. This one's been, no, that isn't one of them either. Well, we'll get to that anyway. <coughs> that have ditches both inside and outside the bank. We have Mayborough in Westmoreland that lacks a ditch entirely and so on. What we seem to have in a number of the Irish examples, and this is an example of that, is a monument that's been raised from a wide, shallow internal quarry rather than a deep ditch. And in this case, as well as one other, what they've done is quarry out the entire interior and pile it up on the outside for a bank. So if you wanted to keep dry during the rainy season, this would not be the place to be because it really forms sort of a, a depression where all the water is going to settle. In contrast, the Iron Age farmsteads all have raised central platforms, usually with a bank along the edge and with a ditch outside, and I'm reasonably certain that they're built that way just so people would keep their feet dry. It gets very wet 
during at least six months of the year in Ireland. The second problem, potentially more serious, was that while the hinges of Great Britain are presumed to belong to the late Neolithic early Bronze Age period, which is dates to roughly uh, from 3000 to 2000 BC, I strongly suspected, for no terribly easily uh, pinned down reason, just a lot of little things, that many of the Irish sites belong to the early Iron Age, around 600 BC. On the other hand, some of the Irish sites were clearly constructed in the earlier period, and at least one British hinge was constructed in the early Iron Age, so we've got some problem with the exact range of dates for them. Even at Stonehenge, which is certainly one of the early monuments, Iron Age material has been found in excavation. The central question then seems to be to what extent there is continuity of belief and ritual practice throughout the prehistoric period. Uh, after all, once you had something like Avebury, there was really not too much reason to build a new one. These monuments, just like medieval cathedrals, are very durable. All right, the hinges in Great Britain have been classified into two basic groups, depending on whether they have one entrance or two. Um, after 15 months of tromping through the fields of Ireland and crawling through hedgerows, brambles, and what have you, and all kinds of weather, mostly wet, I've covered very superficially about one-tenth of the island and found 55 earthworks I was willing to call hinges. I retained the basic requirement that they have entrances, but I didn't think this, uh, this one entrance, two entrance classification would work, and about the same time some people in England were coming to the same conclusions. So, we now have... Titian and had to be in Switzerland to meet with, his, uh, with his new clients. We're very happy, though, that Dr. Ronald Hicks could fill in with this lecture on uh, hinges and stone circles. He, uh, he made this lecture about a month ago on the uh, university faculty lecture series and it was one that I knew that we would want to schedule in our college as soon as possible, and so I was very happy we had this opportunity. Dr. Hicks has a very interesting bio data. It's about 10 pages that I won't give you all of, but I want to give you uh, some parts of it because it is, uh, it's most interesting. He received a bachelor's degree from Purdue University in 1963, and his major was international relations, and his minor was mathematics. In 1975, he received a, a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and, and his dissertation uh, dealt with the same topic he'll be speaking of tonight. His teaching experience has included Ursinus College, the Wagner Free Institute of Science, Spring Garden College, Hahnemann Medical, Medical College, where he was an instructor in the Institute for Human Resources Development, the Community College of Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, and now he's been at uh, Ball State University since 1976. The courses he's taught along the way have included introductory courses in anthropology, physical anthropology, archaeology, and cultural resources management, seminars in archaeological theory and scientific techniques in archaeology, practice in archaeological research, field methods in archaeology, laboratory methods, European prehistory and Near Eastern prehistory. His field work has included Indiana, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Newport, Scotland, and Ireland. He is a contributing editor of Archaeoastronomy, the Bulletin of the Center for Archaeoastronomy in the University of Maryland. He is co editor for the Old World Archaeology Newsletter. His publications include a collection of books. Bullets, 
publication. No, no Some 
So the game story goes, for one day of the year, the number of our seven small sisters were dancing inside the room. So the game story goes, for one day of the year, the number of our seven small sisters were dancing inside the room. So the game story goes, for one day of the year, the number of our seven small sisters were dancing inside the room. So the game story goes, Unfortunately, the site was a sacred one, and the dancing was a little bit more than the end, because it was such an important event, but it was a very good one, and I think local world was not to be able to perform two ceremonies, but it was so enraged that when I saw the turn, the local world was still the seven sisters in the ceremony,
Now, it's very likely that dedication ceremonies for these things in the beginning of construction is very likely that all the earlier things are going to be festival. The beginning of construction is just close to having people gather together and they can make it to do something. So the further factor that may have been what we do know for some of the guarantees is that the world has been given to us as a site of the Nusa Mystery River from the calendar that was neither a story of Yorga nor a story of the next day on top of the calendar. Even today, we have a few years of the mind calendar for some purposes that we have still coming up. Even today, we have a few years of the mind calendar for some purposes that we have still coming up. The names on the first Sunday, Easter, after the first day of the moon, the following is the first Sunday. After the change of the moon, the last of about 20 years, the moon and the solar calendars can be synchronized, but it takes a 19 year cycle to do it. The moon and the solar calendar, 19 years from now, is a question of the time from the sun, and it's a moment ago. This is called the time from the moon first. And there's one classical reference a moment ago that the Shannon Mockerology Stonehenge, the Lord of God, which describes the circular temple of the Lord of God, the island 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 of the Lord of God, the the Greek reference to the Apollo of Jansen, the Tip of Monument, may be reflected in one of the Greek reference to the Apollo of Jansen, the Giants, may be reflected in one of the alternate names of Jesse of Monument, who are going to be talking about the continuity of the world and tradition. This is the various personal personality of which is some of the first and the traditions from the late years of the early Bronze Age period of 2007 traditions. On through the early age of the Christian time, and the long list of the now, on through the early age of the Christian time, the Christian information brought some more clues to how history can be used. The Christian shape on the half times of the current course may have entailed new information, just a few points. Here, I find it is first of all considered a show, but I don't know if you just slap and burial kiss. And First of all, we have an excavation for a variety of wooden structures in a site that's often mimicking the stone of the rest of Ireland. Only rarely, an interesting point about this one, and the up until the Dunal and the other. An interesting point about this one, certainly in the last 50 years, this was continued to be used as a burial ground for unbaptized infants. So we also have a huge burial site that was made in the same way that was killed 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 in the same way that was um, the majority of the hinges and stone circles are circular. The majority of the have ellipses and the stone circles are circular. The center is flat. The hinge have ellipses and stone circles as well. 56 pieces of plans by the way that Alexander Thomas did with formations on them. The obvious assumption there are never enough variations in monuments to conserve these monuments. The obvious anomaly is that they represent our stone community. So if these monuments do not have enough anomaly, then you have the question of why they're irregular. Yeah. So what did the burial yeah. mean? Yeah. 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 It's been suggested yeah. they made maybe some monolithic yeah. diamonds, but it's not quite clear. Yeah. 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 Yeah
sacrifice may have been one of the first elements uh, in our picture of how these monuments were used. Some other people would say that they had a scientific use. As long ago as the mid-18th century, antiquarians pointed out that the midsummer sun rose over this so-called heel stone at Stonehenge. If you stand in the center of Stonehenge on a midsummer day and watch the sunrise, it comes up more or less over that. It actually comes up slightly to the side, but when it's just above the horizon, it sits on top of the stone. Around the beginning of this century, Sir Norman Lockyer, who is uh, an astronomer and founding editor of Nature, confirmed this observation and pointed out that another common orientation in the stone circles was that for sunrise on May Day. Now, May Day is one of the old quarter days. It marked the beginning of summer under the old seasonal calendar. We've since changed that, but this is why Midsummer's Day, the longest day of the year, sometimes is called Midsummer's Day. It's the first of summer for us, but it used to be considered the, the middle of it. In the mid-1960s, there developed a renewed interest in this whole problem of astronomy and the monuments. The work of C.A. Newham and Gerald Hawkins, Stonehenge, Dakota, and a Scottish engineer by the name of Alexander Tom. The work of Norm and Hawkins showed that at Stonehenge, not only were the solstice positions marked, the midsummer and midwinter positions, but also the equivalent lunar positions. The lunar, the uh, moon moves along the horizon uh, as the sun does, or appears to move along the horizon. Its movements are a bit more complicated, though. It takes only a month rather than a year for the moon's rising and setting position to move from north to south. And the sun's extremes each year are just about exactly the same. The moons change over an 18 and a half year period between maximum and minimum lunastices or lunar standstill positions, whatever you want to call it. Alexander Tom did a number of very careful surveys of stone circles, over 150 of them, and showed that these orientations are found not only at Stonehenge, where they may be, might be simply the result of coincidence, but in fact were common among these early monuments. They were common enough that they couldn't possibly be coincidence. They are in fact common among other early monuments. Work by um, Michael Kelly at Newgrange, this big mound you see in the background here under attack by the Irish Board of Works, actually the Irish Tourist Board, they wanted to restore it, so that's what all the reinforced concrete's about. Uh, most archaeologists are not terribly happy with the result. But <coughs> In any case, work here and at Maine's Howe up in the Orkneys uh, have shown that these two were used astronomically. Now, if we look at Newgrange, we find this earthen mound 40 feet high, and there's an entranceway with this heavily carved stone standing outside it. You'll see there's a doorway and a little opening above the door. keep pointing with my hand there we go. That little opening is important. If you go into this, you find a stone passageway some 70 feet long, leading down to this chamber in the middle. This thing was built in 3100 BC, so it's 5,000 years old. Good architecture. It's not fallen in yet. This is done by crumbling, overlapping the stones. Um, this is one of the side chambers off of the main chamber in the, in the center of this thing. The rising sun at midwinter solstice shines through that little box over the door and down the passageway all the way into that central chamber and lights it up. It's the only time that happens. The same kind of thing happens at May's Howe. Now, O'Kelly discovered this uh, when he discovered it was known in local tradition. 
And here I must again raise the question of continuity. It's been suggested that Newgrange is a corruption of the Irish Anua Grana, which would mean the Cave of the Sun. This monument was sealed for a long time, and it would be, uh, it would appear that knowledge of this midwinter illumination survived for several centuries, even though the monument was sealed up, and you couldn't get in and see it. A step further back, we find that in early Christian times, the mound was considered the home of Angus, thought by some to be a sun god. He was some sort of deity in any case. Earlier still, gold Roman coins were left in front of the monument's entrance. This is 3,000 years after it was built. Apparently, as a votive offering, these were left. Thus, it seems likely that vague partial traditions, at least, pertaining to the function of Newgrange survived for nearly 5,000 years. If so, perhaps we should seek other traditions reflecting possible astronomical, or at least calendrical, associations of hinges and stone circles. Some people have argued that they're very precisely astronomical, but, uh, well, as we'll see in a moment, that doesn't quite work. Stonehenge provides an immediate example, since it's in one of the earliest known references in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. It's claimed that the circle was built to commemorate a May Day massacre of a group of British chieftains by Hengist the Jew. Hengist came along about 3,000 years too late for the construction, but it would appear that Stonehenge has May Day associations as well as the obvious one with the solstice. In Ireland, we find another May Day legend associated with the stone circle. This one at a small hinge in this is the game town room just outside Killarney. Um, actually, you find May Day legends with a number of them, but this is a particularly interesting one, I think. At least in the game, so the story goes, one May Eve, seven small sisters were dancing inside the earthwork while their parents stood outside and watched. You can't, there are two other big stones standing out behind where I took the picture. Unfortunately, the site was a sacred one, and dancing was forbidden on May Eve because it was such an important evening in the ritual calendar. So when the local druid came up the hill to perform some ceremonies, he was so enraged by what he saw that he turned them all to stone, the seven sisters and their parents, uh, it is said that if you go back on May Eve, yet yeah, today, you'll see them dancing in midnight moonlight. The Druids, I should say, also are first mentioned in history long after most of these things were built. So you can't just say the Druids built Stonehenge. Uh, there's no clear connection at all between the Druids and these monuments. But you do, in some of them, find very early tales that seem to imply a connection, at least. Um, for example, this is the so-called Dow Hall Henge. It's close to Newgrange. Here we have a place name legend that was written down over a thousand years ago. According to the legend, and apparently it was an ancient legend at that time, there once was a king at this place called Brezel. A disease came upon the cattle of Ireland, and the king, in order to combat it, called together all the men of Ireland to build a monument to heaven to appease the gods. The assembled men agreed that it would only work for one day. To assure that the day was long enough for the job to be completed, the king called upon his sister, who was a druidist, to halt the sun in the sky until the work was finished. Um, it's unlikely, I think at least it's unlikely, to be a coincidence that the axis through the entrances of this monument, you stand here, look out through this entrance, uh, it's taken from the wrong direction, really, but stand there and look out through that entrance, uh, you'll see the midsummer sunrise, just as you would at Stonehenge. An astronomical connection for the hinges and circles seems pretty well established, but I would offer some caution. Gerald Hawkins and, to a considerably greater extent, Alexander Tom have argued that these monuments were really observatories designed for precise astronomical calculations and the prediction of eclipses. I don't think that this can be supported by the evidence, really. The astronomical orientations seem to be essentially symbolic. They're not really precise monuments. Um, they work very nicely to mark important points in the apparent motion of the sun and moon, so that you can emphasize the time, proper time for certain festivals and rituals. Aubrey Burrell has 
shown recently that the position of the recumbent stone in this circle, and in fact in many of these in Aberdeenshire, while they vary considerably, in all cases but one, are the orientation or in the spot required for the um, so, for the moon when it's at its southern maximum to sort of slide along the top of the monument during the course of its journey across the sky. For that, you don't really need a precise orientation. And in fact, precise orientations, as I said, are rarely found in the monuments themselves. But the orientations do cluster around important dates. This is a diagram from Alexander's Tom, Tom's work. And he shows that you get clusters of orientations most of them either at the solstices, the equinoxes, or at the seasonal, um, first day of the seasons, first of May, February, November, and August. Now, my own interest in the archaeoastronomy arose from my analysis of the Irish hinges because it became clear to me that you do get this clustering over in the northeast within the range of the usual places for sunrise. Uh, you also get quite another a bit of spread around the rest of the compass as well. I did a re careful resurvey in 1977 that showed that while it was true in a general way that the entrances cluster around the points for the uh, for sunrise on the festival days, there is a good bit of variation around that day, three or four days each way. And it's perhaps relevant that uh, Anthony Avini at Colgate University has pointed out that at least as late as the 17th century, church foundations in Britain were oriented towards sunrise on the day of dedication. So there seems to be a very long tradition of pointing things at sunrise on the day you build it. Now, it's very likely that dedication ceremonies for these things in the beginning of construction would occur on or near the dates of important festivals just because this is when you have people gathered together and it would have been convenient to do so. One further factor that may have a bearing on the imprecision of the orientations is the evidence from early historic times for the use in Western Europe of a calendar that was neither strictly lunar nor solar, but a bit of both. Even today we do use a combined calendar for some purposes. We have Easter coming up. The Easter, for those who don't quite know the system, is on the first Sunday after the first full moon, following the spring equinox, which means you get a variation of about 29 days in there. The lunar and solar calendars can be synchronized, but it takes a 19-year cycle to do it. Now, that 19 years is close to the 18.6 I mentioned a moment ago. This is called the metonic cycle. And there's one classical reference that may reflect the knowledge of Stonehenge, which describes a circular temple of Apollo on an island far, well, the island beyond the north wind, where the god dances every 19 years. This is in a Greek uh, book written about 50 BC. Stonehenge would seem to fit the description, and it's worth noting that one of the circles, the so-called bluestone circle at Stonehenge, does have 19 stones in it. And this 19 is a number we, again, find repeated periodically. Uh, the Greek reference to Apollo dancing at the monument may be reflected in one of the alternate names that Jeffrey of Monmouth gave for it, which was the giant's dance. So, continuity of belief and tradition. If there is at least partial continuity of ritual, belief, or perhaps just some of the traditions from the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age period, 2000 BC, on through the early Iron Age into early Christian times, when a lot of this got written down, um, perhaps it would be worthwhile to look at that body of information for some more clues to how these things were used. We don't have time to cover this in any great detail, but I will mention just a few points. First of all, consider the shape. That's not a very good, not a very bright plan. But this is on a site called uh, Lisrochen in the west of Ireland. An interesting point about this one is that up until certainly the last 50 years, this was continued to be used as a burial ground for unbaptized infants who couldn't be buried in the churchyard. They buried them here instead because it still was considered a sacred site, even though it's clearly a pre-Christian site. Uh, the majority of the hinges 
and storm circles are circular, or very nearly so, but you do have ellipses, ovals, and flattened circles as well. These are plans of a number of them that Alexander Tom drew. The obvious assumption, if uh, these monuments indeed have astronomical links, is that they represent the sun and moon being circular. If, then you have the question of why the less regular forms. Uh, the only good idea I can come up with for that is that they may be symbolic of the moon when it's not quite full. Uh, the egg-shaped ones, on the other hand, may be tied in with the fact that there's definitely some sort of fertility ritual linked up with these things. In any case, we find not only the shapes to go on, but especially with the passage graves, a lot of petroglyphs, stone carvings. You saw the big stone in front of the entrance of Stonehenge with the spirals on it. Some of these can be interpreted as sun symbols, whether you, know, you can see this one or not. But right here we have sort of a spoke wheel thing, which we know was used in many parts of the old world as a sun symbol. There's another one here. This has a bit of fourth, fifth century writing along the edge of it, too. <coughs> um, some of these megalithic symbols, symbols, the penangular circles, look very much like um, Henge monuments. Let me back up a second. Some of the things carved on the stones, in other words, look like the thing in its hinges. Others look like spoke wheels, which, and wheels do seem to have a religious significance in the Iron Age and later tradition. Um, we have something called the Gundestrup Cauldron from Denmark, which portrays a variety of figures taken to be deities accompanied by wheels, holding wheels in the air, things of that sort. At um, the Lugbury Long Barrow in Wiltshire, there's supposed to have been a golden wheelbarrow buried in it. There's a Welsh goddess called Erinrod, which translates as silver wheel. And wheels were not to be turned on the quarter days of Inbolk and Samhain, in other words, beginning of February and November. Even the Iron Age farmstead, which is circular in form, have until recently been, been considered dangerous. Uh, the domains of the fairies and other spirits from the pre Christian past. And a circular form is, uh, in some way, connected with sacredness. And perhaps related to this is the idea, evident from several hymns, uh, where the banks were once white. Now, down in the south of England, this is easy. This isn't far from Stonehenge. And this, you've got a chalk bedrock just a few inches down. This one has real ruts chariot wheel ruts from the Iron Age. This is an old Iron Age fortress. So at Stonehenge, we have a chalk bank. Further north in Yorkshire, the bank of this earthwork, coming around here, was originally covered with gypsum. And though we don't have excavation evidence to confirm it, the medieval Vincentus tales refer to the earthwork at Tara as white flanks, as though it also had been covered with something white. The question then is, is this in some way tied in with the whiteness of the moon, because you find the moon linked with these sites? Even passage graves like Newgrange and Mouth were faced with tons of white quartz, which they had hauled from some 30 miles away. Quartz paving and megaliths are found uh, in the stone circles, here we have what's well, not quite a megalith, not quite a big stone, but a quartz boulder that lies on the line from the center of the stone circle toward the uh, sunset at Halloween, that following the beginning of winter in the real calendar. All right, what about the, uh, well, one thing we can say about the quartz is that it certainly would have made these monuments shine brightly in the light of the moon or rising sun. The entrances? Why do some sites have one and others have two? Here again we have a clue, perhaps, in an Iron Age or a Christian document, which says that it refers to burials in small enclosures in which a single entrance was prescribed for the grave of a man of learning, two for a woman, and none for a child. A similar passage occurs in one of these Vincinka stories from the 9th and 12th centuries AD in discussing a festival at a royal site called Teotu. The discussion essentially says 
There's two or two in the back there. Part of it, anyway. The discussion says that the men and women attending the fair sat in different enclosures. The women in one with uh, two entrances and the men in uh, a single entrance. That hands we saw on the crowd that had the female burial in the middle of it, the sacrifice of it, did have two entrances, which seems to fit in with the rest of this. Um, so in some way, the number of entrances is probably tied in with whether they were dedicated to a god or a goddess. The mention of tail two brings up yet another aspect of the Irish tradition. The hinge-like Iron Age royal enclosures and the fairs that took place in them actually up until the 19th century in some cases were all dedicated to women, apparently recognized as the local goddesses of the land in pre-Christian times. Uh, these goddesses, in common with other Irish deities, have the disconcerting habit of dying, uh, which isn't perhaps too surprising because they're all tied in with the agricultural cycle. And if you know classical myth, we have Ceres and Persephone, where Persephone goes to the underworld for part of each year. So, the surviving work at, at Tilton is not actually a hinge. Uh, it's been messed around with a good bit through the centuries. But there's a Tara and Dunalanya, which we saw earlier, this time without the excavation, and an Ewan Maka. It looks very similar and dates to about the same time. Um, all are named for goddesses, while the Kura, in which several of the hinges were found, was sacred to Bridget, who was daughter of the chief of the gods and is in many ways, maybe entirely, identical with the Christian saint Bridget, who had a big you know, monastic site on the edge of the Kura. The festivals or the fairs held at or near some of these sites may give us clues to the type of activities associated with them. It must be emphasized again that we're talking about the possibility of continuity, because the accounts of these weren't recorded until about a thousand years ago. You know, some of the monuments had been in use for a very long time by then. On the other hand, there's ample reason to assume some continuity from pre-Christian times, particularly in view of a document we have from Pope Gregory dating 8601, in which he says, this is to his uh, Archbishop in Britain, talking about how to carry out the missionary work. And he said, to substitute feasts in honor of the saints for the pagan festivals and sacrifices. In other words, don't destroy the old temples, uh, just rededicate them. And it seems to have been exactly what they did. Now, one feature of Omaka here seems to have been horse races. Uh, Maka herself is said to have died as a result of a horse race in which she was pitted against horses while pregnant. Uh, she won, but dropped dead at the end of the race. Uh, the Kura, the Kura can't be uh, with certainty associated with the ancient fairs, but it can be associated with horse race at harvest time. There's a major race course within sight of those Kura hinges I showed you. There's also a tradition of medieval jousting matches in one of the Thornborough Moor hinges, and of horse races and games at the Giant's Ring on the south edge of Belfast, which I showed you earlier. One other hinge, Moundbury Ring in Dorset, was converted into a circus in Roman times, where obviously they had horse races, a la, or chariot races, a la Ben Hur. Now, the accounts of the fairs was usually they were held every third year at harvest time. There's one very detailed account we have, dating from about the ninth century, which speaks of a series of seven races as well as music, the telling of ancient legends and myths, a recounting of the degrees and pedigrees of king, funeral games to honor the dead, markets and general socializing. Until the coming of uh, the Vikings, Ireland didn't have cities, and these periodic assemblies were really the best opportunity people had to come together to trade, uh, to arrange marriages, to do whatever kinds of things required a large group in one spot to do. Well, the stone circles, we don't have perhaps as much to go on. There are a lot of traditions. A lot of them, unfortunately, are quite late. I have one picture here that is not of a stone circle, but it may give you an idea of something that went on. This is actually from Virginia in about 1650. So we have a circle of wooden posts with the, the faces carved on it. Uh, 
The names you find with a number of the stone circles suggest that dancing may have gone on there. We have giant dance, piper stone, um, and you can compile a list of probably a dozen or so that have names implying dancing. Now, the Jinshinkit tales provide one other interesting comment on the possible use and possible occurrence of these things. I should have stated the last one. In talking of uh, my selects in County Cavern, they say, to there was the king idol of Aaron, namely the Chrome Korak. And around him twelve idols made of stones, but he was of gold. In other words, one there was a gold stone or whatever, a gold covered stone perhaps, in the middle of a circle of twelve others. Uh, in the tripartite life of St. Patrick, the twelve sub gods are said to have been covered with copper. And it's quite possible that the stone circles, the stones in these circles were originally covered with gold or copper. Not surprisingly, this would have disappeared as soon as the religion changed. Um, it's also possible that these were images of the gods, or perhaps merely symbols like the ones we saw earlier. And in several places we find the so-called eye goddess that you see carved on the stone at Midrange, the double spiral, the sort of the nose. Some of the examples of this look very much like owl faces, and they have been called the owl-faced goddess, too. We also find standing stones heavily decorated. This is the Turo stone out in the county of Common. That thing around it to keep the cattle away, sitting out in the middle of the pasture. Um, in Scotland, we have Pictish stones. This is sitting in a stone circle. More cattle. You can see this one has what looks like a crescent moon on it, in fact. These date to probably between the 1st and 4th centuries A.D. And the, exactly the same symbols are repeated all over Scotland on stones like this. Even at Stonehenge, we have symbols carved on the stones, daggers. No one noticed these until the 1950s. But they are typical Bronze Age daggers in shape. Well, to summarize, there are other clues to the functions of the hinges and stone circles I haven't discussed. Uh, details on traces of pit, timber structures, other central structures, evidence for fires, associated pottery, antler pits, so on and so forth. We have other characteristics such as the tendency to site them near water, and the evidence for big fires in the middle of them, and so on. However, you know, we can't really cover all of that. So let's summarize what we have so far. As always in archaeology, we're trying to put together a picture puzzle that has about 95% of the pieces with it. But if we look at the archaeological evidence and the folkloristic evidence, and bear in mind the very big question mark about how much continuity there was from the prehistoric past into early historic times, here is the kind of picture we get. The hinges, as they originally appeared, were not all the grass covered in banks we see today. Rather, the, many of them glowed white in the light of the sun and moon. The stone circles also were brightened by quartz pavements, quartz stones, and perhaps by gleaming seeds, shoes of copper and gold. To the builders, the shape of the monument was itself probably an expression of sacredness, circular like the sun or full moon, or flattened like the moon in another phase, um, reflecting an earth and stone, the symbols carved on the stones of the passage graves about the same time. by the way, is a map of where you find passage graves, mostly along the Irish Sea and on each side of The alliance of the hinges, stone circles, and passage graves to the sun and moon is reflected in yet a third characteristic, their orientation towards less than important positions on the horizon, whether to northerly or southerly limits, to the place of rising or setting on festival days, or to the way the monument was dedicated, or even to, as in the case of the recumbent stone circles, an arc where the moon could conveniently be caused to sit atop a stone. Whatever the exact orientation, it seems certain to have been chosen primarily for symbolic and ritual reasons, rather than through any dedication to precise astronomical orientation and mm -hmm. observation. The ceremonies and rituals that took place in the monuments we can only dimly perceive. One would appear to be human sacrifice, probably in dedication to the monument, perhaps at seasonal festivals, or important times thereafter. 
Perhaps the Hindus with one, hint, one entrance were dedicated to a god, while those with two were belonged to a goddess. Alternatively, uh, the number of entrances could have been controlled, or could have controlled who could take part in the ceremonies. In any case, there does seem to be some connection, at least in the Iron Age, between the number of entrances and the sex of the people in some way involved with the monument. The sacred precincts seem to have served as a focus uh, for seasonal feasts and fairs, often at the beginning of harvest or on one of the old, other old quarter days. In later times, at least, the fairs included horse races, games in honor of the dead, recitation of the old legends, and more mundane pursuits like marketing and socializing with friends. In the case of the stone circles, dancing seems to have been an important part of the ceremonies. The exact nature of ceremonies probably varied from region to region. The beliefs may have as well. We have what appear to be the same deities called by different names in different parts of the island. Ceremonies, beliefs, and designs undoubtedly changed through the centuries as well. Uh, though past forms would have had their influence, just as churches yet today are influenced by the medieval. These variations that we find have allowed the identification of the four broad classes of Hendon in Ireland and others in Great Britain. A lot remains to be done. The picture is dim at best, and the details will never be completely filled in, but we, I think, can at least begin to understand one aspect of the lives of the people who built these monuments. All right. What? questions. circular form. Even the Iron Age farmsteads, which are circular in form, have until recently been considered dangerous, uh, the domains of the fairies and other spirits from the pre-Christian past. So the circular form is uh, in some way connected with sacredness. And perhaps related to this is the idea, evident from several Hindus, uh, where the banks were once white. Now, down the south of England, this is easy. This isn't far from Stonehenge. And if you've got a chalk bedrock just a few inches down. This one has wheel ruts, chariot wheel ruts from the Iron Age. This is an old Iron Age fortress. So at Stonehenge, we have a chalk bank. Further north in Yorkshire, the bank of this earthwork, coming around here, was originally covered with gypsum. 
And though we don't have excavation evidence to confirm it, the medieval Vincentus tales refer to the earthwork at Tara as white flanked, as though it also had been covered with something white. The question then is, is this in some way tied in with the whiteness of the moon? Because you find the moon linked with these sites. Even passage graves like Newgrange and Mouth were faced with tons of white quartz, which they had hauled from some 30 miles away. Quartz paving and megaliths are found uh, in the stone circles where we have what's well, not quite a megalith, not quite a big stone, but a quartz boulder that lies on the line from the center of the stone circle toward the uh, sunset at Halloween, at Sawway in the beginning of winter, under the old calendar. All right, what about the, uh, well, one thing we can say about the quartz is that it certainly would have made these monuments shine brightly in the light of the moon or rising sun. The entrances, why do some sites have one and others have two? Here again we have a clue, perhaps, in an Iron Age or a Christian document, which says that that refers to burials in small enclosures in which a single entrance was prescribed for the grave of a man of learning, two for a woman, and none for a child. A similar passage occurs in one of these Denshinka stories from the 9th and 12th centuries AD in discussing a festival at a royal site called Teochi. The discussion essentially says, there's Teochi in the background, part of it anyway, the discussion says that the men and women attending the fair sat in different enclosures. The women in one with uh, two entrances and the men in uh, a single entrance. That hinge we saw on the Kura that had the female burial in the middle of it, the sacrifice in it, did have two entrances, which seems to fit in with the rest of this. Uh, so in some way the number of entrances is probably tied in with whether they were dedicated to a god or a goddess. The mention of tale two brings up yet another aspect of the Irish tradition. The henge-like Iron Age royal enclosures and the fairs that took place in them actually up until the 19th century in some cases were all dedicated to women, apparently recognized as the local goddesses of the land in pre-Christian times. Uh, these goddesses, in common with other Irish deities, have the disconcerting habit of dying. Uh, which isn't perhaps too surprising because they're all tied in with the agricultural cycle. And if you know classical myth, we have Ceres and Persephone, where Persephone goes to the underworld for part of each year. Well, the surviving earthwork at, Ta at Tilton is not actually a hinge. Uh, it's been messed around with a good bit through the centuries. But those at Tara and Dunalanya, which we saw earlier, this time without the excavation, and Ewan Maka, which looks very similar and dates to about the same time, um, all are named for goddesses, while the Kura, on which several of the henges were found, was sacred to Bridget, who was daughter of the chief of the gods and is in many ways, maybe entirely, identical with the Christian saint Bridget, who had a big uh, monastic site on the edge of the Kura. The festivals or the fairs held at or near some of these sites may give us clues to the type of activities associated with them. It must be emphasized again that we're talking about the possibility of continuity because the accounts of these weren't recorded until about a thousand years ago. Well, some of the monuments had been in use for a very long time. By then. On the other hand, there's ample reason to assume some continuity from pre-Christian times, particularly in view of a document we have from Pope Gregory dating 8601, in which he says, this is to his uh, archbishop in Britain, talking about how to carry out the missionary work. And he said, to substitute feasts in honor of the saints for the pagan festivals and sacrifices. In other words, don't destroy the old temples, uh, just rededicate them. And this seems to have been exactly what they did. Now, one feature of Owen Maka here seems to have been horse races. Uh, Maha herself is said to have died as a result of a horse race in which she was pitted against horses while pregnant. Uh, she won, but dropped dead at the end of the race. Uh, 
the Torah, the Torah can't be uh, with certainty associated with the ancient fairs, but it can be associated with horse racing at harvest time. There's a major race course within sight of those Kura hinges I showed you. There's also a tradition of medieval jousting matches in one of the Thornborough Moor hinges, and of horse races and games at the Giant's Ring on the south edge of Belfast, which I showed you earlier. One other hinge, Mountbury Ring in Dorset, was converted into a circus in Roman times, where obviously they had horse races, a la, or chariot races, a la Ben Hur. Now, the accounts of the fairs, was usually they were held every third year at harvest time. There's one very detailed account we have, dating from about the ninth century, which speaks of a series of seven races, as well as music, the telling of ancient legends and myths, a recounting of the degrees and pedigrees of kings, funeral games to honor the dead, markets and general socializing. Until the coming of uh, the Vikings, Ireland didn't have cities, and these periodic assemblies were really the best opportunity people had to come together to trade, uh, to arrange marriages, to do whatever kinds of things required a large group in one spot to do. Well, the stone circles, we don't have perhaps as much to go on. There are a lot of traditions a lot of them, unfortunately, are quite late. I have one picture here that is not of a stone circle, but it may give you an idea of something that went on. This is actually from Virginia in about 1650, where we have a circle of wooden posts with the, with the faces carved on them. Uh, the names you find with a number of the stone circles suggest that dancing may have gone on there. We have Giant's Dance, Piper's Stone, and you can compile a list of probably a dozen or so that have names implying dancing. Now, the Dinshinkit tales provide one other interesting comment on the possible use and possible appearance of these things. I should have stayed with the last one. In talking of uh, my Schlecht in County Cavern, they say, "'Tis there was the king idol of Aaron, namely the Chrome Korak, and around him twelve idols made of stones, but he was of gold. In other words, one, there was a gold stone or whatever, a gold covered stone perhaps, in the middle of a circle of twelve others. Uh, in the tripartite life of St. Patrick, the twelve sub-gods are said to have been covered with copper. And it's quite possible that the stone circles, the stones in these circles were originally covered with gold or copper. Not surprisingly, this would have disappeared as soon as the religion changed. Um, it's also possible that they bore images of the gods, or perhaps merely symbols like the ones we saw earlier. And in several places we find the so-called eye goddess that you see carved on this stone at Newgrange, double spiral, the sort of a nose. Some of the examples of this look very much like owl faces, and they have been called the owl-faced goddess too. We also find standing stones heavily decorated. This is the Turo stone out in County Ross Common. That thing around us to keep the cattle away is sitting out in the middle of the pasture. Um, in Scotland, we have Pictish stones. This is sitting in a stone circle. More cattle. You can see this one has what looks like a crescent moon on it, in fact. These date to probably between the 1st and 4th centuries A.D. And the exactly the same symbols are repeated all over Scotland on stones like this. Even at Stonehenge, we have symbols carved on the stones, daggers. No one noticed these until the 1950s, but they are typical Bronze Age daggers in shape. Well, to summarize, there are other clues to the functions of the hinges and stone circles I haven't discussed. There are details on traces of pits, timber structures, other central structures, evidence for fires, associated pottery, antler picks, so on and so forth. We have other characteristics such as the tendency to cite them near water and the evidence for big fires in the middle of them and so on. However, well, we can't really cover all of that, so let's summarize what we have so far. As always in archaeology, we're trying to put together a picture puzzle that has about 95% of the pieces missing. But if we look at the archaeological evidence and the folkloristic evidence, and bear in mind the very big question mark about how much continuity there was from the prehistoric past into early historic times, here is the kind of picture we get. The hinges, as they originally appeared, were not all the 
grass covered in mountains we see today. Rather, many of them glow white in the light of the sun or moon. The stone circles also were brightened by quartz pavements, quartz stones, and perhaps by gleaming sheaves of copper and gold. To the builders, the shape of the monument was itself probably an expression of sacredness, circular like the sun or full moon, or flattened like the moon in another phase, um, reflecting in earth and stone the symbols carved on the stones of the passage graves about the same time. This, by the way, is a map of where you find passage graves, mostly along the Irish Sea and on each side of it. The alliance of the henges, stone circles, and passage graves to the sun and moon is reflected in yet a third characteristic, their orientation towards celestially important, important positions on the horizon, whether to northerly or southerly limits, to the place of rising or setting on festival days, or to the day the monument was dedicated, or even to, as in the case of the recumbent stone circles, an arc where the moon could conveniently be caused to sit atop a stone. Whatever the exact orientation, it seems certain to have been chosen primarily for symbolic and ritual reasons, rather than through any dedication to precise astronomical orientation or observation. The ceremonies and rituals that took place in the monuments we can only dimly perceive. One would appear to be human sacrifice, probably in dedication to the monument, perhaps at seasonal festivals or important times thereafter. Perhaps the hinges with one, hand, one entrance were dedicated to a god, while those with two were belonged to a goddess. Alternatively, uh, the number of entrances could have been controlled, or could have controlled who could take part in the ceremonies. In any case, there does seem to be some connection, at least in the Iron Age, between the number of entrances and the sex of the people in some way involved with the monument. The sacred precincts seem to have served as a focus for seasonal feasts and fairs, often at the beginning of harvest or on one of the old, other old quarter days. In later times, at least, the fairs included horse races, games in honor of the dead, recitation of the old legends, and more mundane pursuits like marketing and socializing with friends. In the case of the stone circles, dancing seems to have been an important part of the ceremonies. The exact nature of the ceremonies probably varied from region to region. The beliefs may have as well. We have what appear to be the same deities called by different names in different parts of the islands. Ceremonies, beliefs, and designs undoubtedly changed through the centuries as well. Uh, though past forms would have had their influence, just as churches yet today are influenced by the medieval ones. These variations that we find have allowed the identification of the four broad classes of henges in Ireland and others in Great Britain. A lot remains to be done, the picture is dim at best, and the details will never be completely filled in, but we, I think, can at least begin to understand one aspect of the lives of the people who built these monuments. All right, lights.